Hey, this is John Adair out of Eugene, Oregon, and you're listening to The Candid Frame. When it comes to being a celebrity portrait photographer, there's a lot that you have to learn that has nothing to do with photography. That's actually the easy part. As Liam Neeson famously said, you need to possess a particular set of skills. Skills that include thinking on your feet, leveraging your strengths and minimizing your weaknesses, and knowing how to solicit something genuine from your often photographed subjects. Jesse Dittmar relies on extensive research on his subjects before portrait shoot. This allows him to build rapport with a subject who is often faced with fawning praise and mundane questions. When Jesse had the chance to photograph the musician Sting, he had to temper his fanboy impulse. Instead, he used his research and a shared interest to elicit a genuine moment. I, I'm a big chess player, and I knew he was too. I knew he had played Gary Kasparov. Um, and I had that information in my back pocket. I didn't lead with it, but I went through the whole photo shoot, and I didn't get him to smile or laugh even once because uh, he's got that stoic sting face on. And then I bring up this Kasparov thing I know about, uh, and I'm a chess player, so I can talk chess, and I get him to laugh. And uh, it was perfect, you know? Like, I, I didn't use the picture of him laughing, but I, I knew I wanted to see what that looked like. And so it's, it's research like that that matters to me. And in this highly competitive field, there is one skill that is essential above all others. And that's how you react and respond when things go terribly wrong. As was the case when he was scheduled to photograph actor and comedian Aziz Ansari at a public radio studio in New York City. I get to the building and we start setting up people kind of looking at me like they don't know who I am. You know, like someone knows I'm on a list somewhere or whatever. And... They don't really have a space for me, so we're setting up kind of in this common space um, outside the the recording studio. And the boss of the location, I, I don't know exactly what her title was, was just not okay with us, not okay with doing the photo shoot. And whoever had said we were all good to go in the totem pole, whether that was his publicists or someone at the uh, at the Washington Post at the LA Times which we did that shoot for we didn't ask the right people and she kicked us out you know 30 minutes before Aziz was supposed to get there we'll talk to Jesse about how he pulled off that shoot at the last minute and how his father's example helped him to prepare for his career as a photographer this is Ibarian X and welcome back to the Candid Frame I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with you. I'm glad you Me reached too. out. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, once I got your book, it was really interesting. I was just taking a, a look at it, and I see a lot of portrait books, and there was just a lot of stuff that sort of piqued my interest about uh, about the way you work and how you look at people, which is really kind of interesting. Thank you. Uh, but I want to get started off talking to you about uh, music, because I know that's one of your passions. Yeah, absolutely. But what was the first full album or CD uh, maybe dating myself by calling it album. I never know what to call, what to call it sometimes, <laughs> especially nowadays. But what was the first complete album that you heard that had an impact on you? Oh man! I mean, the first it definitely CD for my for my okay. uh, <laughs> my age for sure uh, in the in the mid nineties. There, I mean, that's two 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 things. I, I think the first music that really had an impact on me was the Beatles. And it was my dad playing the Beatles just like in the house around like as a kid and me, Mm -hmm. me understanding that it was more than just music. It was a specific band. And, you know, funny enough now, because I'm a huge Beatles fan still, it was like, I really connected with the Ringo stuff, (laughs) which as a kid makes sense. Cause I think it has a little bit of the, it has a childlike quality to it in a good way. And then the police as well. Uh, I just remember, you know, my dad's in the music business, so he would just be downloading so much music into my head. But those were the first two bands I really remember from like a pure listening standpoint. But then the first couple of CDs that I went out and purchased myself were probably Green Day, Dookie, which 
is still a good album. And I remember that uh, the Presidents of the United States of America album back in like 90, what, 93 or 94. Okay. Dude, I don't play that stuff on set though, you know, but like, you know, it's it's really interesting how you know, music defines most people's experiences. And that's why I love using it as a tool in my photo shoots because everybody, you know, every, who doesn't like music? Everybody loves music. Yeah. It's for, for me, I think that the more recent generation sort of misses out the full experience by just listening to singles. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, for me, the album is really the artist's sort of declaration of who they are in that particular moment in time. For sure. And and for me, I, I still like listening to the entire thing and, and enjoying it as a complete experience. Yeah. And I don't know whether there are artists out there that really consider the album's in that way, like they did, you know, back in the day, or is it just an amalgam of, of, of singles? I think it's more of the more of the latter now, for sure. That's I mean, too bad. with Spotify, I don't even people ask what I'm listening to now, and I'm like, check out my playlist. I, I don't even know the names of some of these songs, but they're fantastic. So, yeah, it, it's definitely a singles world now. I mean, in every in every aspect. But I you know, I, I think it's a reason why vinyl is coming back a bit is that it, it, it forces you, you know, you can't skip a track and it forces you to sit down and, and wrangle with that whole body of work that's in front of you. It really show it's a great medium to showcase full length albums. It's kind of like judging a photographer on a single photograph. It's like, yeah, wouldn't... or or looking at the contact sheet. I mean, I remember back in back in high school, my photo teacher would always want to see my entire contact sheet because he'd want to dissect my decision-making process down. And it was really helpful for me to, to at that time value every shot I took and value the process of going through from A to Z, knowing that someone was going to see everything. Mm -hmm. Now I'd be scared. I'd be scared for someone to see everything. Jeez, (laughs) this is like so vulnerable. (laughs) Well, you mentioned your dad, who was an agent for uh, musicians. Uh, Yeah. Tell me about that experience of, you know, going with your dad to work, which in this case was was, was performers. What what did you learn about interacting with people in, in, in showbiz as a result of watching your dad? It's funny because you don't, he wasn't teaching me in an, in an overt sense while I was a child, he was just letting me experience these really unique situations where, which were going to a show, going to Madison square garden, going to these giant arenas, going backstage, which was just so much stimulus for a small child. And my first show with him was, I was five years old or something like that, four or five and going to these places where everyone's outside and you get to go back and, and you're, you know, be part of this special crew that, is in the behind the scenes and doing the work and and then going into these small rooms these dressing rooms with these people that you knew were famous whether you knew that you i mean i purely knew they were famous as a small child just because they were there you know just because all these people were outside there to see them and so i didn't even need to know who they were really to to have the gravity it put inside me that though these people must be important uh and then to see him interact Uh, with famous people in a normal way was just a, it was in me from the beginning, how, how to just be in a room with people you knew were famous and not be, not be strange and not be weird and be normal. And, and I didn't realize that I had that amazing, you know, testing and learning ground as a, as a person until I, until I was on my first famous photo shoot with a famous person where it was just like, Oh, I, I grew up in rooms like this. It's just now I have a camera in my hand and it's just invaluable. And something I didn't really, really didn't connect until recently, um, that, that it was such a good training ground for me. And, you know, just seeing, seeing my dad go up to people who I knew were famous, shake their hands, look them in the eye, be able to have small talk with them. Then he would turn around and say, this is my son. And, and he, you know, he would teach me to shake their hands and look them in the eye. And then all of a sudden he would move on. And then I'd be talking to some famous person as a small, a small kid when I'm like 10, <laughs> 11, 12 years old. <laughs> and you're just standing there and you have to say something. <laughs> and you just learn by that process. You know, I would go to, I would go to a show with him probably like once a month until I was 18 or something like that, you know, um. like and and so you just learn by that process what works what doesn't what's it like to be in these scenarios and you know by the time i was an adult it 
completely was a training ground for what I do now, you know, being able to talk and be comfortable with people that you know are people that matter, that other people think matter. What, what do you think is one of, the, one of the more common mistakes that people do make when they're interacting with a celebrity, whether or not they're photographing them or not? I mean, it depends on what you're trying to get out of the scenario. You know, I think that if you're not trying to photograph somebody and you meet a celebrity and you're idle, you know, like if you're respectful, I'm sure you can do whatever you want. You know, like, you you know, it's I don't think there's mistakes being made. You know, celebrities are celebrities. They know they're celebrities. As from my perspective, as as interacting with them in a professional sense, you know, I think that the most common mistake is not being able to treat them as a peer, even if you don't even if you aren't really a peer, you mm-hmm. know, it, it's, it's hard. It's, I've talked about this before, you know, when I photographed Sting, I, I, like I said before, I had a relationship with him since I was five years old, you know, by the time I photographed him, that was like a 22 year relationship I had with him. And he, he, his relationship with me started the day that I walked in the door. The second I walked in the door, the discrepancy between the two is, is just insane. Uh, and you, can't bring that 20 years of baggage to an interaction because it's just plain weird. You know, you yeah. can't you, like he, he can't relate to the fact that I've, I've known him for way longer than he's known me. And if you try to explain that to someone, it just doesn't work or I haven't seen it work. Uh, you know, there's no, he's heard so many people be say, oh, I've been a, f- I've been a fan since I was a kid, you know, like what, any reaction he has to that is going to be a, what I call like a stock reaction. You know, it's the mm-hmm. kind of thing like I don't I don't like to ask questions that I know a lot of other people are asking because then the person in front of me is going to start giving their stock response and their stock emotions and their stock faces, the things that I'm interested in, their looks. You know, they get into these routines because they know what works. And so bringing up that you're a huge fan there's a right time to say that and i do say that sometimes for sure but in general i just shy away from from fandom yeah and and embrace embrace a person in front of me and try to connect on a level that we can actually connect on because i can't connect with sting on almost anything that has to do with the police (laughs) (laughs) i I have a similar experience probably not to the degree that you have but you know there have been times where i've i've had a chance to sit down and interview people whose work i have been observing for 30 maybe sometimes even 40 years yeah right who sort of have shaped the way that i see and how i make photographs and and like you said you can't go in as a as as a fanboy no and and it helps that well it helps to a degree that I know a lot about them beyond their their work, because almost immediately I can begin the conversation on on some point of interest yeah. that they have a sincere interest in, and is is that something that uh, that you do as well when you can? Absolutely. I mean, when I do research, we do tons of research before we do shoots, especially with I mean, with anyone really. It depends on how much time we are going to have with them, but. I do research personally and then I also have uh, producers that help and do research and my direction's always with them. You know, I don't care about the new movie. I don't care about the new book. Like sh- get me, get me the biographical details. Get me the, where'd they grow up? Where are they from? Where'd they go to college? What are they interested in pop culture wise? What are they interested in sports wise? So they have kids. Are they married? Are they divorced? Like th- just quick avenues of, connection that I can try to get someone to be engaged with me as quickly as possible and as authentically as possible. Then I go use those tools and and wrap them into the experiences that I've had and try to make a genuine connection with someone really quickly. So I do do a lot of research with, you know, again, bringing it back to to Sting, you know, I, I'm a big chess player and I knew he was too. I knew he had played Gary Kasparov. And I had that information in my back pocket. I didn't lead with it, but I went through the whole photo shoot and I didn't get him to smile or laugh even once because uh, he's got that stoic sting face on. And then I bring up this Kasparov thing I know about uh, and I'm a chess player so I can talk chess and I get him to laugh. And it was perfect. You know, like I, I didn't use the picture of him laughing, but I, I knew I wanted to see what that looked like. Uh, mm. and, and so it's, it's research like that that matters to me. Again, anything shying away from the 
the thing they're talking about on a daily basis on their press tour or when they're meeting someone for the first time and they're a famous person, that person's usually doting over their favorite movie that they're in or their favorite album, things like that. Like, I'm not interested in, in going and breaking open those things because I, I know what happens when you do. With a lot of the celebrity photographs that you've made, you have not been afforded much time. So as much as research as you may have dedicated to to the person, sometimes you may only have like five minutes in which to photograph them. Exactly. So, you know, when you're in the in the space and, you know, you figured out all your lighting and your positioning and you have only that finite period of time, how do you sort of leverage your skills as a photographer, your ability to sort of build rapport with a limited time and all of that to be able to elicit that that thing you need to be able to get a photograph that's more than just a snapshot of someone in front of a of a background. Sure, I mean, I think the difference is 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 like I was saying, just just genuine engagement and genuine presence, and that's that's what the research is for, and that's what the conversation is for, and that's what the that's what bringing my own attitude and my own engagement is for. You know, it's. I have such a genuine interest in the people I photograph. You're in a, in a situation that it's really hard to shy away from. Like it's hard for, for someone to not recognize that you're having interaction because you're photographing, you know, they, they, they're stepping in front of my camera in front of a backdrop. It's a photo shoot. They know mm. what's going on. And if they're truly disengaged, it's, it's hard for them to maintain that uh, because of everything that's going on around. So that on top of, my sincere interest in them and showing that I've done my homework and showing through the professionalism of our operation, our lighting, my assistants, the research we've done, sometimes we're putting up, um, sometimes we're putting up imagery on the wall that we want to try to emulate certain aspects of. And uh, you bring all that to the table and you just try to try to get this person on board and do it as quickly as possible. Because if, when you only have five minutes, I got like 90 seconds to get Tom Hanks to buy in. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm going to spend that first 90 seconds of, and I had a shoot with Tom and it was, I think about 12 minutes. And I spent the first 90 seconds just not using the camera, just showing some work, talking to him, getting conversation going. And when you think about it, like 90 seconds doesn't sound like much time, but in the context of 12 minutes or 11 and a half minutes, that's like 20% or 15% of your time, you know, or 20% of your time. It's important, valuable seconds. But for me, it's the rest of the shoot's going to be irrelevant if you don't connect with the subject. And, and I try to get that going as quickly as possible first. So, so what's the idea uh, behind showing them, showing them the work that you've done before? It's all about proving to someone who, do, you know, listen, like at this, at this juncture, every year I, I work more people that I walk into the situation, they know who I am, which is great. But you know, when I walk into the room, Tom doesn't know who I am and he doesn't know if I'm competent. And so my goal with showing him some work is a, you're in good hands. B, let me show you some people that I know, you know, mm -hmm. and that helps immensely, you know, like, Oh, Hey, you photographed Lily Tomlin. I had her lunch with her on Tuesday. Like I, I love Lily Tomlin. That's a good picture of my friend. Great. Let's do the thing. And it just is a, another tool in the tool belt to try to get get your subject to buy in to what you're trying to do, you know. And I only show a couple photos, and I have that really curated. I, I go, okay, let me let me put people in this book who I know they know in on the iPad, you know, or whatever. Let, let, let me front load this with people I know they know and other shots that might be similar, and try to quickly and articulately let my subject in on what we're trying to do here and get them on board and then go make a great picture. Uh, there's a, a sh shot in, in your book of Al Green that I really, really love. Uh, it's not in the book, actually. It was on your website of him behind the desk. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, I read the story about the, that whole shoot, and about all of the challenges that you, you had, and I want to hear about that. But when I looked at that shot, I thought it was a remarkable shot because I think of all the challenges that any photographer can ever have is photographing a subject behind a desk. <laughs> it's just like oh it's god not easy. oh no but that shot is just so wonderful uh tell me about that image and what we're just talking about here in terms of eliciting something really genuine from someone in in a scenario that is one of the most difficult types of photographs to to pull off well 
I mean, listen, it's easy to photograph someone behind a desk when it's Al Green's desk because the <laughs> accoutrements in his office were just unbelievable. I mean, the guy, if you go back and look at that picture, the guy has just I think it's five or six framed photos of himself behind his desk in different eras of his career. The main one of him with his shirt off, like just looking like an Mm. uber sex figure from the 1970s, like just one of the coolest pictures, just sitting right behind the guy you're photographing. I mean, it's hard to make a bad picture in that scenario because the room has set you up so Mm -hmm. well and set me up so well. And then the emotion was just, you know, I I just remember that Al was really tough because, you know, I think he, he is a personality that is floating, floating through the world in, in, in this, you know, he, he's, it's been so long. He's been an icon for so long. And, and he has a mode of operandi when he's Al Green, how he kind of like floats through a room and he he kind of like doesn't speak super clearly a little. So it's like, you know, whenever you're dealing with someone like that, you're like trying to communicate, but you're not really, you know, when you're when you're meeting someone who has either a heavy accent or, mm-hmm. you know, it, he doesn't have an accent, but he kind of has a similar type vibe to his um, the way he talks. And I just remember. I just started talking about the room because the room was so amazing. And I remember, I remember that shot specifically that you're looking at. I asked him about this giant bowl of hard candies he had on his off on his desk. And he was like, I love hard candies. And he just started freaking out about the candy on his desk and how much he loved it. And that was the, that was the motion that he made. He was Uh. making this like praying motion to like the joy he gets from candy. And it was, you know, I could just tell I would say from from a skill set perspective, I could just tell being in his room in in his office how much he cared about what was in the office. It wasn't it wasn't a place that he was in just because someone put him there. It was a place that he curated, that he had love and tenderness in every single item that was in the office. And so I just started talking about the office because I knew that that's what he cared about. Yeah. It was obvious by being in there. Uh, so that was just a good example of. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to connect with him on, you know, it was, it was a really challenging, strange scenario from the get go. And then I walk into this space that's so has clearly so much curation and so much love from the subject that, Oh, we can just talk about this. This is going to, this is going to be great. And it was, but that day started off crazy because you were short on equipment. And yeah. So tell us about, tell us about that. I mean, you know, it was one of these things where I, this happens to me all the time where it's like, go shoot Al Green in Memphis tomorrow, you know, pretty much, mm-hmm. it, it, or, or something similar to that. So number one thing was get to Memphis. And then once I was there, I had to wake up and start calling around for, I needed, I needed an assistant. I needed some light stands and I got a little lucky. I mean, it's hard to remember at this juncture what that really felt like, but I was in some strange Graceland hotel that had maybe a thousand pieces of Elvis kitsch plastering the walls like strange night of sleeping uh and just wake up call the rental houses anyone in town try to find an assistant try to find a a couple pair of c-stands because the photo shoot's not waiting for you so it's definitely a big part of my job and a big challenge of my job to check all of that production level challenges at the door along with the fandom yeah when you walk in because they don't care or won't it doesn't matter to the picture that it's been hard getting there. I like to say that I wish that my portraits when they got get published and they get published that they ha- would have a degree of difficulty score next to them. So <laughs> you could ju- so you could judge how how difficult the situation was. Obviously there's not, but I think it'd be nice with of all the images in magazines had little degree of difficulty scores next to them so you kind of were able to judge judge the production hassles, but then everyone would give themselves tens because uh, every, everyone everyone has their own problems in trying to make photos. It's all right. Not, give me a, give me an easy. Uh, give me an honest score for the Aziz Ansari shoot. Uh, I mean, that was straight. That was a straight ten. I mean, <laughs> that was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. Want to sh- share the details of that with us? I mean, the brief details are this, and this again happens where I, I'm told I'm going to get to go to photograph Aziz at at, at NPR or uh, WNYC. Uh, he's doing an interview there. After the interview, come out do the shoot. They're on board. Everyone's on board. Someone tells me everyone's on board, and I get to the building and we start setting up people kind of looking at me like they don't know who I am, you know, like someone knows I'm on a list somewhere or whatever. 
and they don't really have a space for me. So we're setting up kind of in this common space outside the, the recording studio and the boss of the location. I, I don't know exactly what her title was, was just not okay with us, not okay with doing the photo shoot. And whoever had said we were all good to go in the totem pole, whether that was his publicists or someone at the, uh, at the Washington Post, at the LA times, which we did that shoot for, we didn't ask the right people and she kicked us out, you know, 30 minutes before Aziz was supposed to get there. And there was just nothing we could do. You know, I, I did my, my best to beg, borrow and steal and plead with her and, and try to make it happen. But she was pissed because no one asked her and she was the boss Mm -hmm. and I get it. You know, I've been in that position before and she was the final say. And so I just started looking through my phone. I just started looking through the contacts in my phone, trying to just get any sort of spark of, uh, you know, eureka moment of someone who could help me because I didn't want to go and shoot on the street because we were in, we were in midtown Manhattan and I needed a place to, to do my thing, you know, and my friend Lindsay's f- name came up and I was like, I think Lindsay works at CBS radio and I'm pretty sure that's across the street from here. And I called her up and I said, what can you do for me? And she made a call and all of a sudden I was setting up in a CBS radio hallway next door. And I mean, it was super lucky, but at the same time, it was also a couple of things, you know, knowing, knowing your city, knowing that CBS was near in WNYC, uh, that, that was just, I don't know. I've lived in New York city for 15 years. So it's just one of those things that gets into your head about where stuff is and, and having good spatial awareness. And then, having good friends that you can count on, you know, and, and not, listen, I, I still use a ton of help from so many different sources that help me make the work that I make and not, not overusing any one source, uh, and not relying on someone too hard so that when you do call in a favor, like a big favor, like you have the ability to photograph as he's and sorry for a big feature on him and you're getting kicked out 30 minutes before the shoot's supposed to start of your location, like that you can call on a whole host of people to help you out in that scenario. Yeah. And we got the shot and it was, it was wild. It was just crazy, but uh, I love the pictures. How did you sort of recover emotionally so that when Aziz was ready to shoot that you weren't all pumped up with adrenaline and I probably was, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that if there's if there was some documentary footage, it wouldn't have looked so good as far as my uh, as far as as far as my mental state. But, you know, I don't know. I think it's a again, it's a skill set on on knowing and how to compartmentalize and how to turn turn stuff off and turn stuff on. Mm. You know, for some reason, when the photo shoot starts, it's about the photo shoot and it's not about anything that happened before the photo shoot. And it's not about anything that's going to happen after the photo shoot for me. It's about the person that's right in front of me. And, and usually when I start freaking out is after it's done and I'm just exhausted, I'm just, you know, I'm sure that that shoot was in the morning and I'm sure I was just done. I I, like you'd run a marathon because your adrenaline is going so hard and you're in fight or flight mode. You're, you're backed into a corner and there's no, there's no giving up. So I'm just usually just really amped to just solve the problem which is extremely mentally challenging. And it's why one of the reasons why I love this job is all, all the problems we have to solve and all of the different equations we have to get around in order to get a good picture. You know, every, every single shoots quite different and makes, makes every, you know, every day, every year that we work really exciting. Cause it's not, it's not the same thing over and over again, no yeah. matter what you do. You know, with, with the, a lot of the, the, the portrait, one of the things that I really appreciated uh, with you was the subtlety of the expressions. And because I think when people think of about a, a portrait, they're often expecting someone to sort of smile at the camera. And though you have some people smiling in, in the camera and some of your, your, your photographs, there are other images where the expressions are just slightly, I don't want to use the word off, but there's this little sort of quirkiness, um, sort of an oddness to them. And when you're making the photographs, are you aware that you're looking for those or is it something that reveals itself as a result of looking at what you've shot from, from the session? It's definitely a big part of the editing process for sure. 
I think editing is underrated for most for most photographers. Uh, it's really challenging. It's really challenging to edit your own work, especially if you have a good subject. It's really hard because there's so many good options, um, and it's hard to find the one that works. And not every picture also works in every uh, outlet. You know, some some pictures work in the book, and then they don't work online, or or you know, some pictures will work in different layouts than others, and and talk to different different pictures before and after them. So having a variety is great, but I find that I get those expressions just from the process of doing the shoot and having it be so conversational. You know, a lot of my pictures that I end up using are pictures that are reactions to stories that I'm telling and little bits of conversation that we're having, or they're directly after someone has just told me something or done something. So a lot of those moments can have a little bit of that awkwardness because they are split seconds right after someone stopped talking or someone's about to start talking. And there's like a little bit of an anticipation to it, or there's a little bit of a release cathar- catharsis to it. That's, that's what I think is the reason behind those looks. But you know, it's hard to say we're talking about 125th of a second. So, yeah. you know, it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly how it happens. Cause that's, that, that's part of the challenge in, in terms of photographing someone when you're engaging in them in conversation is waiting for those beats in, in between. And, uh, sometimes you get people who just can't stop talking. (laughs) Yeah, that's a problem. And sometimes I, sometimes I just, and the perfect, when that happens, I just, I just tell them, Oh, hold that for one second. You know, like, Oh, hold on. You know, like you, you, you can, I try not to be super directional when I'm photographing someone, um, as far as telling them exactly what to do and how to act. But, if it's not working, I will have to go there. And that's fine. You know, in my experience, I, I love it when someone's in the middle, when someone's doing lis- when someone's listening and someone's talking and they're mm-hmm. doing both throughout the conversation, which is the definition of someone being in an engaged, present conversation with you. They both listen and talk. Uh, and so I'm really trying to get someone th- to go through the gamut of emotions in a 15 minute period where I'm going to get something that's contemplative reflective, serious, happier, some joy sometimes, you know, I'm trying to have a conversation that kind of runs that gamut as much as possible. And then in the editing process, we're going to figure out what worked, you know, and what, what, what really feels authentic, what feels like a really great moment from that, from that experience that we just had. And so it's a combination of both. Thanks to the many people who took the time to say hello to me while attending the Focus on the Story Photo Festival last week. It was an amazing time and it meant so much to me to meet so many fans of the show and and to lead a workshop in the nation's capital. Next weekend, I'm in LA teaching my weekend street photography workshop at the Los Angeles Center of Photography. There are two spots still available, so sign up soon. And in August, I'll be in Vancouver, Canada, teaching a weekend workshop with my friend and one of my favorite photographers, Olaf Stava, a previous guest of the show. It's going to be an amazing time with Olaf and me, and you don't want to miss it. And lastly, George and the Betchy and I will be conducting a complete cultural experience in Tokyo, Japan in December, which will include not just photography, but food, culture, and so, so much more. It's going to be a very personal experience and one you don't want to miss. To find out more about these events, please visit the website or click on the link in the show notes. I hope to see some of you there. Help the Candid Frame to continue bringing you great conversations with some of the world's best photographers. You can do this by supporting our Patreon effort by committing as little as $5 or more a month. When you do this, you not only help us to meet the cost of production, but provide us the time and resources we need to bring you conversations you won't hear anywhere else. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Thank you. Most of the portraits in the book are of of the face. And a lot of these people, because they're photographed of a lot, there are a lot of portraits that are made of their of their face. You know, they're, sure. they're readily recognizable and so on. Some people, though, it's not just about their face. There's a presence 
that they hold just in terms of how they occupy their body. And I'm wondering whether you've had an experience where you have arranged to photograph someone and you've discovered that there's something about their physicality, not just what their body looks like, but just the way they, they hold themselves that you feel like, I want to use this as part of the photograph. Do you have an example of that? Well, I think you're getting at a couple of things. You're getting at like posture and, and kind of body physiology of a person, which is always such a unique fin- fingerprint mm-hmm. um, of someone. And, and a little bit of their, of, I don't like using this f- term so much, but a little bit of their essence, you know, it's the reason why I photograph these people because I get a sense of what they're all about just by them walking into the room, you know, uh, just by just the way that they walk in the room and their body language throughout the brief experience is informing who this person is in, in context of everything I already know about them, um, or, or might learn about them. So that's really exciting for me. You know, it's really exciting for me to be able to say that I've met the sitting presidents since I've been working and that I've met, you know, some of the biggest music movie and art figures of my time and, and be able to say like, I, I, I can understand something about them that I never could have gotten if I didn't get to see their presence in person and have the ability to really study it from a photographic perspective. And so, yeah, I, I, when I, when I notice someone has a unique, you know, way of holding themselves, I'm probably going to use it. And you, you know, it's, it again, depends on the scenario, what kind of room I'm in, you know, do I have the ability to pull back? You know, sometimes I'm in such tight spaces that I, I couldn't get a full body shot if I wanted to. It depends on what clothes we're talking about and what the fashion is and how the clothes, you know, interact with their, with their body posture and how they, how they operate. And it it depends on how comfortable they are in their own skin, you know, like, but I I don't know that before the shoot happens. So before the, before they walk in the door. So I, I kind of have to be prepared for anything. And if I get someone who's really comfortable in their own skin then I can get cool stuff like the picture I have of Denzel Washington with him throwing his hands at me, you know, or the picture of Carolina Herrera that I, that I did where she's got this like hands on her hips and she just looks like a total boss and she is a boss and it just worked, you know? So it just, to me, it's, it's kind of like a gut thing. When someone walks in the room, you just, you, you start to envelop who they are and, and really read that as quickly as possible. And, go through the whole process that we talked about. Yeah. Starting the conversation and getting going. Yeah. I think what I'm talking about is, is presence. Cause I've I've met, I've met a lot of people who are famous or celebrities and for the most part, maybe they're just normal people, but there have been a handful of times when I have encountered a a person who embodies the sense of having a presence. I remember, I remember watching two dancers from the Harlem Ballet, right? Yeah, I photographed some Harlem Ballet uh, people as well. Walking down the street, and it was just like, okay, there are gods among us, right? (laughs) Because you could see there were just... Well, dancers specifically, their whole job is knowing how to put their bodies in any place, you know, like having complete control over their bodies. And so whenever I photograph a dancer, it's just a dream because I can ask them to do anything and I know they can do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can, usually I'm not telling people what to do with their physiology because then they start thinking about the thing you've talked to them about. Mm-hmm. So like, I don't usually tell someone to, oh, do this with your hands or face or body because then all of a sudden they're like, well, what's wrong with that part of me? Yeah. <laughs> but when you're working with a dancer, they know exactly what you're talking about and they can immediately do it. And it's like, you know, really special super yeah. special because yeah, what was amazing about these these two is they were they were just walking down the street yeah and it was like basically this the, the sea was parting people were just but it was a perfect walk it, it was <laughs> <laughs> and you could just see that they just it was a constant thing for them which yeah i think that one of the great things about doing this kind of portrait photography also is what, what you're kind of touching on is getting a sense of what it takes to be a kind a certain person in the world like getting a sense of what is it like, what, what are CEOs of major multi-billion dollar corporations like? What do you have to, what do you have to be as a person in order for that to be your job? Because I've met a dozen or more billionaire CEOs, so I start to get a sense of what that's like. Or what is it like to be a Tom Hanks? And what is it, what is it like to be a super mega movie star? 
what kind of person is the kind of person where that happens to and same thing with dancers and so it's really interesting because you start to see when you start to get more and more experience and photograph more and more people you start to see these commonalities between professions and between where people are in their lives uh and you start to understand what it takes to be this kind of person in the world which i find really fascinating and really interesting You've worked as an assistant uh, for Ben Baker, Annie Leibovitz. You mentioned Chris Buck right before we started. What did you learn from having the opportunity to work with these photographers that you felt was really invaluable? Jeez, every, I mean, everything. I mean, well, I assisted, for, I assisted solidly for five years, and I learned as much what to do as what not to do uh, from, from the great photographers, like you mentioned, Ben, Annie, and, um, and Chris. You know, you learn... It's like a tool belt. I Ben Ben used to give this analogy. It's like a tool belt as an assistant. Like you're 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 seeing you're picking little specific things that these photographers that you're working with do amazingly well. And you're unlocking the mystery and magic behind how they do it. And so then you can apply those techniques to what you do when you need to. But you also if you're smart really understand that the reason why Annie's pictures are the way they are is because she's Annie. And what does that mean? You know, what, what does she bring? What is her presence at a photo shoot that sets the tone to end up getting the final product that you see? Looking back on it in hindsight, I wasn't really thinking about it in the, in the moment. But looking back on it in hindsight, I, I learned that you need to embrace as a portrait photographer, who you are, because that's what your pictures are going to be. They're going to be you. And if you acknowledge and can get to the kernel of what you do really well and what your personality allows you to do, and then you can use that as a tool, it'll be really powerful and you are going to make really unique images because you're a unique person. And so that was the coolest thing about assisting all these photographers is just, just seeing what the secret key and the secret ingredient to their work was. That's a macro level. On a micro level, it was an amazing grad school learning ground for everything technical, everything, you know, light, lighting, camera systems, production. How does it all just work? You know, I got so much experience in every single photographic scenario that I, I still haven't walked into a photo shoot that I haven't felt comfortable on because I didn't see it as an assistant, uh, which is really valuable to me that I've been able to walk into most scenarios and go, oh, I've been here before, just not as the photographer. Uh, it's been super, super helpful to being able to focus on making good pictures and not on the kind of overstimulus of, wow, what's going on here? You know, how you know, I've never had to deal with these problems before. Uh, so it was just a really amazing learning ground for me. Um, and, and having mentors too. How can you, you know, you can't put a price on that. You know, when, when photographers take you under their wing and teach you, you know, and, and let you let you make mistakes and keep you around uh, to see more and to, to be better. I mean, I, I'm grateful for those people all the time. What made you a good assistant? Well, at first I was a terrible assistant, <laughs> so we can get that out there. Um, and I was a terrible assistant because I always wanted to be a shooter. And I always had this, like, kind of shooter mentality. I always had, like, a little toe out the door that, like, oh, if, if someone asked me to do a photo shoot, I'd be, I'd be out of here in two seconds. Um, and And... Even if you think you don't have that mentality, if you have it, you have you have it, and and it's a problem because being a photo assistant and being a photographer are two completely different jobs. And if you want to be a photo assistant, you have to commit full time to to and and put all of your energy into being a good photo assistant. When I decided to do that, when I realized that that was the case, yeah, I turned into a really good photo assistant because I learned I learned how to do it you know it's it's a it's a job like anything else I, I got to the point where my experience and my skill set was valuable enough for me to be a real asset to uh to photographers from a lighting gear know-how production travel and awareness sense it's ironic because when I was least prepared to be a photographer I was the worst assistant but then as I became close to making the leap myself I was a great assistant uh, and I wasn't going to be around very long for people because I was ready to go do my thing. Um, but I think a really good assistant is someone who has a foresight into what you need. A really good assistant is someone who can think like a photographer, but not act like one. 
and and can say, hey, Jesse is going to need a light over there in like 30 seconds because the light's moving and we need to go in the corner and get an environmental shot. And we didn't set it up, but and then 15 seconds later, I'm like turning around to about to give that direction and it's already done. And it's really hard to have that kind of like foresight. It's like a little bit this mystical foresight. But when you work with someone long enough and you know what they do and how they do it, you start to understand that. And a good assistant will learn every shoot and get better and better and better. But, but explain that a lot. The second half of that statement says you want them to think for as a photographer, but not be a photographer. What's the second half of that? What's, how is that problematic? I mean, not be a photographer. I mean, in the moment, you know, not, not, not in a general sense, uh, but in, in on the photo shoot. In terms of thinking, you know, this is what I do. In, in rather, terms of in the room, you're you're an assistant, and you know you're an assistant, and that's what you're there to do. And you're not thinking like when I was an assistant and thinking like a photographer, I wanted to know. I I just had an enormous curiosity about how changing one variable changed the way the picture looked. And I was constantly thinking about thinking from a photographer's perspective, like, oh, if I move the light here a little bit, it's going to look like that. And like, I had this, this photographer's curiosity as an early assistant and to my detriment, because then you can't focus on what needs to get done. And you're, you have so much that you're trying to learn. It's hard to be a good worker. Um, but by the end of my assistant, I started to, to realize if I was a photographer, which there is one standing right in front of me. I wouldn't like the light like this because of X. So I'm either just going to move it because I know that's the right call or I'm going to whisper, Hey, what do you think about this and move it? And the photographer is going to say that was a great idea. And it becomes much more a good assistant. It becomes much more. This is an idea I have that is a solution based oriented idea. Uh, about making the picture, making your picture better. And to get to your direct question about not like having, again, not feeling, what can I say other than it's like a aura around you that, that you, that you're a photographer that you want to, that's not the right way to say it. It's like when there's assistants on set that are really, really experienced and, and you can tell they're going to be shooters, they're just, they're not usually thinking about what's best for the picture in the moment that day, right then. And, and they're much more kind of like, like I was in the beginning, just trying to suck as much information out of the situation as possible that they can then utilize for themselves later. And it's, it's not necessarily anything, one thing that someone might say or do, it's just more of an attitude. And, and it can become really confusing for clients or subjects when they turn around and they start asking assistants like, oh, what do you do? Are you a photographer? And then it, it, the thing as it, from my perspective is I want everyone who's on my team to be focused on a singular goal of getting the shot that we need to get. And if there's any, any other tangents that are distracting for my team, it's just taking away from our goal because we have so little time and so little room for error that it's really important that everyone's that everyone is focused and, and a good photo assistant's focused on what the, sh- the needs of the shoot are. Yeah. So what finally propelled you to make the, the leap from being assistant to becoming a, a photographer and how'd that go? It was tough. <laughs> it was tough. Um, I mean, I was on a photo shoot with, with Ben in, in, in the white house with the Obamas as his first assistant. And I think it was the third or fourth time that I had met, met the president and his wife. And I just, I felt like I had done it. I just felt good. I felt, I felt, felt like I had finished school and it was a great way to go out. And when he gave me the call and asked, asked if I wanted to be on board for that shoot, I made a mental note, like, this is a great, this is a great one to end on for me. And I stuck to it after that shoot. We did a great shoot. It was, it was, Ben took an amazing picture and of them together. And, and I never assisted again. I, I, it was hard. It was almost two years of, of being jobless. You know, I thought I was ready to be a photographer. It turns out just because you think you're ready doesn't mean you're ready. It doesn't mean people, other people think you're ready. And I was just trying for a year and a half, two years, just to let anyone, just to beg, beg anyone to hire me to photograph for them. And, uh, and you know, it almost didn't happen. But then 
just when you're about to quit, that's when stuff stuff starts happening. And, uh, you know, the Washington Post called me to photograph um, the actress Adina Menzel. And then within 12 months after that first photo shoot, I had done 80 photo shoots in, in a 12 month period. And it was just like went from zero to 80 really quick. It was amazing. It was a challenging period, you know, um, but what can you say? It's it's it helped. It helped strengthen me for where we're at now. And I'm doing I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do, which is take these pictures. Two years is a long is a long time, it, especially when you're like in that in between phase. Yeah. And how do you resist the temptation to not go back, especially when, you know, the bills are coming in? You're not getting any work. You're maybe having meetings, but nothing's happening. And, you know, the temptation is, well, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should just go back to, I'll just do this one assistant job and, and that, that'll be okay. And then it ends up being a slippery slope. So how do you resist it when, when you're in the midst of the storm and not uh, turn tail and, and go back home? It's hard to say, you know, I think it's part, it's part personality based. Like I'm, I'm pretty stubborn, motivated, driven person. And so when I make a, when I tell myself I'm not going to do something anymore, I'm, it's going to be really hard for me to change my mind on that. And that, I think that helps big time. I think I had a lot of support. I know I had a lot of support. I had a, an amazing partner at the time who is now my wife and, you know, she was, all in on what I was trying to do. That didn't make it easy, though. I mean, it definitely started to get a little rocky there towards the end of this run. And yeah, people are still... But, you know, I think I think what was easy when it become a little bit easier is when it becomes that long, the people that used to be your clients from a photo assistant perspective, they stop calling because they know that you're not doing it anymore. So it's easier, it's easier to... It's easier not to call them asking for work than it is if they were still calling me and me having to turn them down. But I remember in the beginning, I'd get a call from a photographer that didn't know I wasn't assisting anymore. And they'd say, Oh, I got this big shoot, you know, are you around? And and I'd say, no, you know, I'm not assisting anymore. I decided I'm going to start shooting. And, Oh, and then they, they give you the talk. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy. And blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, they call you back like 10 minutes later and they're like, how much money do you want? <laughs> and, and you're like, you know, I'm just, I'm out, you know, I'm, I'm out and I'm not coming back. And that's hard. I mean, it's really hard, but at the same time, I couldn't do it anymore. I was done putting up light stands for someone else. And if it wasn't going to happen for me as a photographer, I felt confident enough in myself that I didn't want to be a career assistant. I, I, I didn't want my career to be assisting. And so at a certain point for me, I felt like I needed to make a clean break from it in order to free myself mentally and try to be a photographer. And I think that if that didn't work out, I would have ended up just being something else, but not going back to a system. There are a lot of uh, people who are career assistants and they choose not to become photographers. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. But there are a lot of people who want to, but never make the leap. So why? I can understand why, because you know, it's, it's a great job, especially when you're young, especially until like your mid thirties. It's a great job. It's super engaging. You get to do amazing, cool things, go to amazing places, meet amazing people. You're doing a job where you get to see your work in the world. I mean, it's really exciting. One of the reasons why I love being a photographer is that we actually make something that is palpable. And as an assistant, you get to say, hey, I was on. I mean, my assistants text me now when they see advertising around New York that we shot and they're excited. And I'm like, yeah, they should be excited. This happened because of you, you know, like this is your big part of this team. So it's a it's a and, and it pays well. And usually your expenses are covered for you so you can save money if you're smart. It's a it's a smart gig, but it's also a young person's gig. I think that you don't see a lot of assistants that are over the age of 35 or 40. I mean, they're out there, but. You don't see it a lot because it's a, it's a, it's a hard job. You know, it takes it physically. It's a, it's a difficult job and mentally, you know, it's, it's a lot. So I knew it was, I knew it wasn't something that I wanted to do personally because the primary goal for me assisting was to learn and it wasn't for, for a job. Um, I didn't, you know, like when I, I remember, I always think about this. I remember when I worked for Annie Leibovitz, like, I think our days were like 16 hours or there was something crazy. And like, I didn't, even though I was a four or five year assistant, I didn't charge overtime because I just didn't want to give them a reason not to hire me again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like looking back on it, I, they probably were expecting me to, but 
you know, other than paying my bills, if I, as long as I was paying my bills, I didn't really care about how much I was getting made if I was work, if I was working for the right people. Cause I just cared about learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I, you know, my agent's going to kill me for saying this, but I kind of feel the same way about being a photographer now. Like I, I just, I just love meeting people and learning. And like, I, if I didn't have to talk about the money, I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's just an amazing opportunity to, to live life and go have the opportunity to go photograph people that are really defining the era that we're living in. It's yeah. just so cool. Tell me about your baby, that Hasselblad and the film you put through it, that uh, the images that are in the book were made with a, with a Hasselblad and you incorporate yeah. that into your, your, your shoot. What's the, uh, what do you love about it? Shooting, shooting with it. I mean, it's a great camera, you know, they brought it to the moon, so it works. It's just a, it's a wonderful piece of machinery. And listen, first and foremost, I love the aesthetics and that's the most important thing is that I get pictures from it that are, my pictures and it, it, it's a tool that helps me create the kinds of pictures I want to create. So that's the first and foremost thing, but it also serves as a really great tool for people. Again, like we were talking about earlier in the show, taking, taking you seriously, you know, a standard digital Canon or Nikon camera is a camera now that is super automated that a lot of people just think they know how to use, you know, people that you're photographing, they might own them. You whip out the Hasselblad, my Hasselblad's from the from the early 60s. It's all manual. There's no electronics in it whatsoever. I have to slow down and shut up because it's a slow piece of machinery, which is great for me and great for the shoot in general. And, you know, I would say a solid, like, eight out of ten times someone's going to mention, like, oh, wow, what's that? You know, what's, 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 what's this camera? What are you doing? Like, it, it just, it's a really good act break in the middle of the shoot where it provides a, like a punctuation mark or, Oh, something's different. And it's another way for the subject to engage in what you're doing. Uh, and sometimes they don't care, but more, more often than not, I, I'm getting a comment like, Oh wow, is that film? Like, like, Whoa. And those moments, right. When I take the camera out, I get a different level of engagement usually with my subjects. It's just, you know, one of, one of the plethora of things that we use in order to get these these subjects in a headspace to take a engaged present portrait. And the film you use in, in it are, is what typically I use a Delta, um, Ilford Delta 3200 film, super, super grainy. Uh, and then I really, really vastly overexpose it like five stops. Usually five stops. Three, three, wow. Yeah. Three to five stops. Um, just to really kind of just make it funky. I mean, my philosophy on the aesthetics of film is that if you're going to use film, you might as well make it look like film and there's no <laughs> point in using 100 ISO grain film and making it look like digital. So I, I, I embrace the weirdness uh, that can come out of film and the funkiness that can come. I like when I go to my lab, they, they look at me with side eyes because they're going, so what did you shoot it? I was like, I ah, don't, it doesn't matter. Just do the thing, you know, <laughs> just, just develop it and see what happens, you know, because I only take a roll or two and the idea is I know what I have with the digital and the film is something that is still organic and has the ability for weird, cool things to happen that are, are not purposeful. And some of my favorite pictures come out of that, uh, that process. When you put together the book and you had the layout down and you looked at your body of work in in terms of the book rather than just individual images that were in your portfolio or on your website. What did you think of yourself as a photographer? It's an interesting question. I, it's hard to, when you're, when you're doing the kind of work that we do, which is, you know, a lot a high volume of shooting and your, your years are busy. It's hard to have the opportunity to reflect on what you're doing in the moment. Uh, because, you know, by the time someone sees a portrait that I've taken in a magazine, you know, I probably took it a month before that and I'm already on to the next shoot, you know, and, and it's very on to the next thing typically. So when I just remember when I got the proofs back of the book from the printer in Italy, I was on, I was on a New York city bus <laughs> and just flipping through it. Like I had, like I was stuck on this bus and I had just a moment just to look at this you know, definitive, my first books about my first two years of pictures. So it's a definitive time in my life that was really cool and special. You know, you don't, 
I don't get afforded the luxury of doing that very often. And so I, uh, to go back and have the memories of each shoot, each shoot is a little memory, a little slice, a little day of your life that you have recorded in this amazing book through the lens of this person that you got to photograph. It's one of the reasons why I added stories to the back of the book. So we could flush out a little bit more what, what the, the day was like with that person. It's just really cool. You know, it's, I, I encourage any photographer to make a book because it's a, such a challenging process that when you, when you see it for the first time, it's, it's, there's nothing like it. It's just really rewarding. Yeah. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is that I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Oh, geez. You know, my favorite photographer out right now is Perry Dukovich. I mean, he just shot the time 100. I hate, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be pumping him up here because we're competitors, but <laughs> What I love about Perry's work, I don't even know if I'm saying his name right, uh, like pronouncing it right. Um, it's it's a weird Eastern European name. But, you know, when I saw his, I've been following his work for a while. And when I first saw him, and I, he used to be an assistant for a, a bigger photographer as well. So we had kind of a similar, tr- you know, up, upbringing through the industry. And when I saw his first couple of shoots come out in, uh, I think it was New York Magazine, I just immediately knew that it was like, he was on the cusp of a visual trend that he was starting. And lo and behold, like six years later or whatever, since when he started shooting, everybody copies him Mm. and, and he's just real good. And, but you know what, even with people copying him, he's the best at it. He's the best at these like kind of emotional blurry color pictures that are like fashion, but also portraits and they're weird and have a lot of vibrancy in them. And, you know, he's a couple years older than me, but, you know, I, I, I know the situations he's put in and to see uh, someone make work that's so drastically different to the work I make uh, from the same kind of similar scenarios I'm put in is, is kind of refreshing. So, you know, go check out his work. He's really good. But, you know, after you see it, then come back and hire me to do the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesse, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to have a chance to, uh, to talk with you. Hey, thanks for having me. It was, it's really amazing. And the show is great. I mean, any, any, any show like this that's helping inspire new photographers or uh, kind of get an oral history of what this uh, life is like is, is huge positive. So you're doing a great service. Thank you, sir. Thanks to Jesse for sharing his time and story with us. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting jessedipmar.com. And if you're interested in this book, too, please use our Amazon affiliate link when you make your purchase as it helps to support the show. To be the voice that introduces the episode like John Adair did this week, just send us an audio file recorded on your phone, tablet, or computer saying something like, this is Johnny Smith from Castle Rock, Maine, and this is The Candid Frame. Say it at least a couple of times so we have a take to choose from and include three to four seconds of silence with your voice to help us clean up the audio. And make sure to include a link to your website, blog, or Instagram when you send it to info at thecandidframe.com. And check out my YouTube channel where I offer critiques and evaluations of photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr Pool. You can check out the TCF Flickr Pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. You can purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code PIRELLO40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you've been hearing on the show, please take the time to write a review in the iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcast Store, or wherever you find and listen to podcasts. And if you write a review on a blog post, let me know and send me a link. I would really like to thank you on air. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Tommy Lansley, Jeremy North, Abul Aziz Al-Qatar, Charlie Ferguson, and Ian Miller 
for their recent contributions. Thank you so much. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. And if you scroll down on the app, you'll find a free excerpt of my book that you can download. Download it today. And we also have an Alexa app, so if you have one of those smart devices, download the skill and listen to the show that way. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor. You can find it at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.